So good afternoon to everybody. Can I ask you to take your seat? So good afternoon to everybody. So nice to see all of you here with us this afternoon to discuss about science diplomacy. I'm Cristina Russo. I'm the Director for International Cooperation in the Director General for Research and Innovation. We have a very rich session ahead, a very interesting subject, and we have the honor to have our Director General, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet, who is here with us. So without further delay, I will give you the floor, Jean-Éric, for your introductory words. Thank you very much for being here. Well, my God, what a room, a packed room. Welcome, welcome. It's a real uh, pleasure, Christina. Thank you very much, firstly, for setting up uh, this session uh, with your team. And thanks to all of you uh, for your interest. Uh, communicating uh, Europe through science diplomacy, I think, is uh, one of the most effective ways uh, for institutions, member states, but also European institutions, to engage with our partners uh, across the globe, to also bring partners across the globe together. And science, I think, has a very, very impressive track record as being an enabler for these policy developments and policy uh, dialogues. For this commission, this will serve certainly not change, quite the contrary, as you, as you are well aware. Uh, um, Carlos Moedas has uh, spectacularly promoted it, uh, very much the work done over the last five years um, uh, with many of you here in the room and uh, beyond is uh, also his track record, Christina. Um, and uh, my expectation is that with this commission, which wants and needs to be a geopolitical commission, with a commission which wants also to remain a global player around European values, where very much uh, our challenges uh, as Europe are also translated at world level on climate, for example, but also on the need for fair transitions and just societies. All this means that research and innovation feeds into the policy agenda and in turn allows, um, I think, a very active science diplomacy, which then supports dialogue with the rest of the world along very similar uh, concepts and content. So expect a lot from us and, and more from us uh, in the next period and help us today uh, in the discussion and I would like of course to particularly uh, thank the panel members, help us to, um, to shape this uh, policy, help us and guide us on where we should engage with most impact uh, so that um, we can collectively, uh, across member states and EU Union institutions, and you, our partners across the globe, make the best possible use of um, science diplomacy. Christina, uh, I wanted to finish by saying how impressed I am by the setup of your panel. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly uh, impressed and honored uh, by the participation of Her Royal Highness Princess Sumaya Bintasan of Jordan. She has, um, I think, um, uh, expressed appreciation on the work uh, done with the European Union and uh, with Carlos Moedas and the European Commission. And this probably explains why she agreed um, to be part of our session today, be it by video, uh, but you will see this is a, a very impressive alloc allocution, um, and I think this will kick off a rather exciting panel. These research and innovation days are all over the place, which means that I'm here, but I'm also in another meeting at the same time. I'm not entirely sure how I do that, so I can only apologize. Thank you um, for your attention, and Christina, I hand over to you and wish you a very fruitful session. Merci. Thank you very much, Jean-Éric. Uh, the Director General made uh, half of my job because you already announced that uh, Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Sumaya Bintasan of Jordan, who is the President of the Royal Scientific Society and the UNESCO Special Envoy for, C for Science and Peace, will address us this afternoon through a video message. She couldn't be here physically with us, but I'm very happy to welcome here Dr. Khaled Schreide. He is the Secretary General of the Higher Council for Science and Technology of Jordan. And after the video message of the Princess, he will also read a written statement on behalf of the Princess. So without further delay, I think we could now see the video message of Princess Sumaya Bintasan of Jordan. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address you in my capacity as UNESCO's Special Envoy for Science for Peace. This unique organization of truly global reach helps us to celebrate all that is best about our shared human civilization, both our heritage and our helpful endeavors for a fairer, sustainable and more innovative future. We all share a belief in the power of the human mind to create knowledge so that we may thrive through innovation. We have all witnessed how science has the potential to unite us in a common purpose and to make our societies more equal and more enriching for all. Science gives us the key to understanding where we are and where we may go into the future. We met in Jordan at the Dead Sea under the theme of Science for Peace and issued a shared declaration that called on all to recognize the role of science in building a future that promises greater equality, security and opportunity and in which science plays an increasingly prominent role as an enabler of fair and sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, development cannot be sustainable without the considered use of science and technology and without science, we may never build truly durable societies where equality and fairness make each global citizen a stakeholder in our shared future. The unprecedented challenges that face our planet today may only be identified, analyzed, and ultimately addressed by science. Scientists and policymakers must work hand in hand to ensure that humanity builds a future that is worthy of our creativity, our resilience, and our compassion. A lasting and equal peace on our planet may only be achieved through observation, analysis, and innovation. In short, science is our best hope for a bright and equitable future. The challenges are grave, and we must all work together to tackle them. We must share our knowledge and support one another so that we may realize our full potential as a human family. Our vast and varied history shows that human ingenuity is a trait that we all share. Unity of purpose and a mutual respect for our capabilities are urgently needed so that we may work together to counter the impacts of climate change, ensure water and food security, and set the standards for a prosperous life for all. There are many challenges that we must face now in order to build the global science infrastructure and the capacity that we urgently require. Indeed, over 1 million additional researchers are needed by 2030 in order to achieve the sustainable development goals that aim to leave no one in our human family behind. Great challenges require great scientific cooperation. Science may only flourish through dialogue, through the interaction of people and cultures, through the meeting of minds and the interaction of ideas. Indeed, science blossoms through diversity. At a time when so many of our multilateral mechanisms seem under threat after so many decades of steady progress, and when so many conversations seem thwarted or twisted by misunderstanding and inexact communication, we urgently require honest and measured engagement to reopen dialogue and to empower constructive and critical debate. I look forward to working alongside the organization and to doing all that I can to support our shared commitment to science for peace. Thank you. Very inspiring words. I would like now to invite Dr. Kared Schreide to read the written message on behalf of Princess Sumaya. Please, Dr. Kared. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I'm really honored to deliver this uh, short address on behalf of Her Royal Highness Princess Sumaya bint al-Hassan, President of the Royal Scientific Society of Jordan 
and UNESCO Special Envoy for Science for Peace, who unfortunately cannot join us today. Well, Mr. Jen Eric Bique, Director General for Research and Innovation, Ms. Christina Rosso, Director for International Cooperation, Director General for Research and Innovation, Professor Jean Pierre Forguignon, President of the European Research Council, Dr. Christopher Fall, Director for Science, U.S. Department of Energy, Dr. Marga Soler, Senior Science Diplomacy Advisor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be able to participate, albeit virtually, in this vital session on communicating Europe through science diplomacy. I'm honored to be able to lend my support to your research and innovation days and to affirm a partnership and deep friendship between our institutions, our nations, and our people. There is no doubt that the challenges we face today as neighbors and partners and as fellow citizens of our shared planet require nothing less than openness, dialogue, and mutual understanding. Indeed, if we are to meet the demands of current and future populations while protecting our environment and tackling climate change, then we must change course and we must do so immediately. It's therefore high time that we harness and maximize the power of science diplomacy in order to break down barriers and to deploy innovative solutions for common challenges. In our Arab region and in the wider Middle East, we are especially in need of scientific and diplomatic engagement on vast scale in order to avoid catastrophe. We are increasingly tested by a desert climate, shrinking aquifers, high rates of population growth, and regrettable recent history of conflict, instability, and social and environmental degradation. It's in this context that scientific research and the equitable share of knowledge, ideas, and solutions to common challenges must be at the very heart of our policy making, our po political rhetoric, and our communities. Your help in achieving this is vital and gratefully received. Indeed, it's beyond doubt that science diplomacy driven by valiant scientists and visionary diplomats and policymakers has resulted in some impressive projects around the world and between our regions. Truly inspirational endeavors include Sesame in Jordan, the secret from radiation source that is hosted by Jordan currently, which would not have been possible without the support of our friends in the European Union. We are the closest neighbors and we share a long and complex history. We understand that there are, must always be a strategic imperative, even in the exercise of the most innovative forms of diplomacy, but with our European neighbor, uh, partners, we understand and celebrate the fact that we share so much our values and standards, our desire for peaceful future, and our deep and real understanding of the present and historic effects on co of, of conflict on our societies. In the short video message to follow, or that has been already presented to you, which I recorded last year to mark my appointment as UNESCO Special Envoy for Science for Peace, I make reference to World Science Forum 2017, which was hosted in Jordan by the Royal Scientific Society, and which cast in a new light the interaction of science 
knowledge and cultural heritage in Jordan and our region. With the support of so many friends in Europe and around the world, we highlighted the hunger that exists for a retelling of a story that, was, that has somehow been forgotten by many, our, our story of diversity, innovation, absorption, and adaptation. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time when so many of our multilateral mechanisms seem threatened after so many decades of steady progress, and so many conversations seem thwarted or twisted by misunderstanding and inexact communication, we now urgently require honest and measured engagement to re re reopen dialogue and to empower constructive and critical discussion. Our united efforts here today recognize the power of science for building societies that are more peaceful, more resilient, and more compassionate societies that will endure and that will honor the gifts of creativity and change that define the best of our shared humanity. Let's never forget that we are writing our history, our own history. Our response today will dedicate how our descendants remember us tomorrow. Shall we be the champions of equality, fairness, justice, and peace? And shall we gain ourselves as a decent footnote, a decent footnote of positive impact in the annals of our neighboring peoples? Painful development. I certainly hope so. To help achieve this, we must all offer our voices as advocates for inclusive development and as agents of trust building. I wish you every success with these research and innovation days. Be assured that I'm with you in spirit, and I very much hope to join you all in person very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Uh, now we enter dans le vif de la discussion, and I have the honor to invite uh, the chair of the panel, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, uh, the president of the European Research Council, who has made us the honor to chair this panel. And uh, Jean-Pierre, dear professor, I leave you the floor to introduce the panelists. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be, to be here. So first, I should introduce the panel members, and I will introduce them in reverse order for the, the introduction. So I'm asking uh, Dr. Manga <coughs> Gual Soler to come, uh, maybe with the last chair. She's uh, a member of the, uh, of the advisory group for, uh, for science uh, of uh, Commissioner Moedas and uh, science uh, diplomacy. Now I'm calling on uh, Dr. Paul Rubik, who used to be a member of European Parliament. He was uh, the chair of the STOA, which is the Science Technology Option Assessment <laughs> of the European Parliament. And now Chris Fall, who is uh, the director for science in the Department of Energy, the US Department of Energy, please. So let me start just uh, by explaining why I'm sitting here, in a sense, in the just two sentences, because I want you to speak. No, it's fine. I'm, I'm fine. Um, so um, actually, uh, it turns out that uh, at the European Research Council, we, have, uh, we are supporting projects in all disciplines. Uh, and actually, three years ago, we uh, definitely choose for our yearly conference uh, the topic of science diplomacy. And then we realized that in preparing this conference, uh, which actually was one of the most successful, we had a really huge participation, we really had uh, people doing research in many facets of science diplomacy. As you know, science diplomacy has uh, many different facets. I mean, some of them are quite obvious. They have to do with really uh, getting people from different backgrounds and different uh, countries to work together. I'm going to give an example later, but after uh, Dr. Chris Fall has spoken. 
which is actually the Sesame uh, adventure. I think we should call it adventure because it's a complicated story. Uh, but also we had uh, people who are interested in uh, a number of issues connected to that, which is also that scientists in some country are really facing difficult situations because their working conditions are challenged, uh, even their freedom is challenged because of their work, which is of course something very important. And some other issues which are very much connected to the uh, sustainable development goals are also that the contribution of science for a sustainable future are also something which uh, we know can only be realized if globally there is enough uh, forces joining, uh, working together to really achieve this uh, sustainable development goals. So in a sense, all these facets show that uh, the way science can contribute is very diverse. And uh, the engagement of scientists in this uh, endeavor is really extremely important. Sometimes individually, sometimes through organizations, sometimes really also through the advice. So I think it will be very important that you tell us how you can advise uh, people who are in a political position on, on this issue. The last point I would like to make on this, uh, on this uh, question of uh, science diplomacy, of course there have been historically a number of situations where uh, really the contribution of scientists to science diplomacy was very, very important and actually uh, managed to really open channels which were besides that really closed. So I think we should always keep this in mind, keep this in, mind. in particular in these times which, as you know, tend to be times where there is more exclusion, more uh, tension, and therefore I think scientists altogether should really contribute to really get us uh, over this uh, difficult moment in some parts of the world. And uh, therefore I think we, we should address that. The way we want to discuss it is actually, to, for this, uh, this, for this uh, session, is as really two parts. The first part we thought we should uh, really discuss, in a sense, what is science diplomacy in action? And uh, w this is one, uh, one topic we can discuss. I mentioned Sesame, but uh, I'm sure we will also have others coming up. And the second part was more in the sense, how can we engage the society at large in this issue? And how can scientists contribute to this engagement? In particular, through the next generation. I think uh, that's one issue we want to, to bring up. And I know that uh, this was one of the uh, major efforts made by uh, Paul Rubig in his very successful mandates in the European Parliament was also to, to be interested in having really a science hub uh, really built into the activity of Ladies the and gentlemen, the bridging widening I survived to that, so. <laughs> so I think maybe I give the floor to you, uh, Dr. Paul, sure. yeah, uh, on to tell, tell us about your approach. Maybe you want to, to use the microphone yeah. uh, standing, or you, you, you decide what you prefer. A little uh, sleep deprived, so I need uh, and jet lag, so I need some structure. I have some structure here. Um, Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the United States and in particular on behalf of uh, my secretary, Rick Perry, and the Department of Energy. So I, I do have some prepared remarks, but I think we're actually running short on time already. So I've cut about half of it out. Um, I hope it makes sense to you. It's going to make sense to me because I'm pretty sleep deprived. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm, uh, I direct the, the Office of Science for our United States Department of Energy. And this is a collection of basic science programs uh, that work, uh, does work ranging from understanding the, the very basic constituents of matter all the way to, to understanding what the universe is all about. And I'm uh, really happy to be here at this uh, EU Research and Innovation Day. I think uh, days, the meeting, I think the fact that you're holding this meeting tells the world uh, that you're dedicated to gathering input and perspective from the scientific community as you contemplate the next major framework program. You're signaling through a meeting like this that you value input and consensus by having the meeting. It's evidence uh, to me, I think it's evidence to the world of the continued growth of the EU as a mature 
scientific major power in its own right and one that's distinct from the remarkable history of science uh, here on the continent, European science uh, achieved by individual countries. In the United States, we feel that this kind of bottoms up approach, this kind of gathering information from our scientific community is uh, one of the most important ingredients for our scientific success. We cherish this tradition, we share this value, and so we're thrilled that, uh, that you all are doing something similar for the framework program. And it's likewise fantastic that you've invited international friends that aren't part of the EU, like me, uh, like Jordan. Uh, I think that in doing this, you're signaling your values of inclusiveness. We share this value uh, also. Um, we invite many scientists, maybe some of you in the room here, to formally contribute to our planning process to participate in our, call it a framework program, but in developing the, the research plans that we put forward uh, in the Office of Science and in other agencies in, in our government. These sorts of signals, signaling a goal for consensus in the direction of science, signaling friendship and trust by inviting you know, non-EU uh, countries like mine and Jordan today, uh, these are particular. These sorts of signals are, are particularly relevant as we try to have a discussion about communicating the values of Europe through science diplomacy. So I've said a word a lot here. I've said values a lot. I'm going to talk, obviously, about values, uh, despite the fact that I've cut about half of it out here. Um, the question that was posed to me for participating on the panel is, what can the U.S. and the EU do together to communicate values through science diplomacy? I think that one of the most direct ways that scientists communicate values, shared values, is when we agree to cooperate and collaborate. As scientists, I'm a scientist, I'm a neuroscientist, not a physicist. With, uh, <clears throat> I was a mistaken identity earlier uh, as a physicist. As scientists, it's in our nature to collaborate. We like sharing the discoveries that we make. As nations in the pursuit of science, I think we understand intuitively that looking inward is not the best path to creativity and innovation in science, and that the best science is done in collaboration with the finest minds from around the world. Science is almost uh, always better when it's done collaboratively, done cooperatively. But it's fair to ask uh, whether we should always collaborate, whether we need, uh, in fact, to consider our core values as scientists uh, and not just scientific opportunity when we, when we think about collaborations. Uh, nations choose to embark on scientific inquiry for many reasons. One reason is the excitement of discovery, uh, science for the sake of science, science for the sake of wonder, and sure, uh, also science for the sake of uh, friendly international competition. My country believes that where we share basic values regarding how we do science. We share basic values about how we distribute and use the knowledge that comes from science for science's sake. There's a great motivation to collaborate internationally. We prize this, we do a great deal of this, and I think in doing it, we're signaling our shared uh, values. And um, you know, I'm, we, we want to have a debate here. I think we want to have a conversation. So I'm trying to make a strong point here. Not all collaborations are mutually beneficial, and not all collaborators share common values. And I think we can, and I think we should, use our relative willingness to enter into scientific cooperation as a means to signal our respective scientific values. Uh, amidst the range of human experience, it's truly a choice for us whether or not we can uh, cooperate in science and technology. It's discretionary, and the choices we make signal our values. Uh, it could be in some cases that we're tempted to collaborate for more transactional reasons. We might think that securing some additional funding or some additional uh, equipment or resources is worth placing less of a premium on our shared scientific and technological values. Um, or we might be, be tempted to think as we undertake the, one of the really important things that great nations in science do is to help bring other nations up in science. We might be tempted to think mm, we have to pay less attention to communicating, teaching scientific values when we do that. Uh, we're going to talk about young people later in the program. And I, I think that trying to assure 
the teaching of scientific values when we engage in science with young people is, is also really important. And it's especially easy because we, you know, we, at the level of the EU, we're here talking about the framework. We've got our sort of framework-like programs. It's easy to lose the focus on our core values in science when we're talking about big, complicated programs, big, complicated projects, and mega science budgets. It kind of gets lost in the weeds, and I think we need to, to stay focused. So you ask, you know, the question that was posed was, what can the US and the EU do together? And I would say that as the EU grows into its role as a major scientific power in and of itself, the EU as opposed to the, you know, the great scientific nations uh, in Europe, uh, as a communicator of European values, the EU and the US and all like-minded nations should resolve to defend together the idea that shared scientific values should be the basis of scientific cooperation. Um, uh, and I'm gonna skip that. I think that I'll wrap up by saying that international scientific collaboration is a choice that communicates our values. I'd like to find a way, the United States, to work with the EU to assure that the choices we make to collaborate or not to collaborate are based on principle and not expediency. And they take, we take the long view that includes shaping scientific discourse, scientific values, scientific culture. So uh, that's the point I want to make for discussion. I look forward to, to talking about whether uh, this should be a shared mission of the EU and the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is one element I, I missed to introduce, which I maybe should have introduced earlier, which is for you the possibility of contributing to the discussion through this uh, Slido uh, technique using your cell phone. And so if you have to join slido.com, and then the keyword for this session is um, just uh, uh, R900. And uh, with that, you can ask questions. And of course, I think it's shown on the, on the screen. You can ask questions. Not only that, but the Slido will also compute which questions are the most favored by the public. So you also have uh, the possibility of uh, supporting other questions, even if you, you don't have your own question uh, forward. Just to follow on uh, what you said, I would like to just to bring up uh, with two examples. One, which is a testimony which I got uh, from uh, Fabiola Gianotti, who is, the, as you know, the director of CERN. And CERN is a fantastic international uh, experience. You mentioned these large collaborations. But also, uh, it really means, uh, in order for such an institution to function, that they have to get support from scientists from many different countries. And quite often, it happens that uh, the scientists who collaborate in CERN are coming from countries which are not in really best possible terms, as you know. So I think this is one of the achievements of an uh, institution like this, to really get the contributions from people coming from countries which are not necessarily in very good terms to work together and actually to, to share um, their knowledge, but also in sometimes to also prepare the training for the next generation together, which is uh, very important. Second example, which has already alluded to, which was mentioned in the, uh, the, the speech of uh, Princess Sumaya uh, bint uh, Hassan, is uh, of course the, uh, this example of uh, the Sesame Project uh, in Jordan. So Sesame Project was the idea of providing for the region really uh, synchrotron uh, facility, synchrotron radiation, and you know synchrotron radiation can be used in many different fields. It can be used in physics, it can be used in biology, of course. It can be used also in archaeology, in many different fields. And uh, the key point was to have this uh, facility uh, installed in uh, Jordan, but with the participation of people from all people from the region, all, kinds, all countries. And this has been a long-term endeavor, which I think finally made it. So it's, uh, it's working now, it, start, it had started to work. It required the collaboration, the contribution, both in terms of money, but also in terms of uh, people from uh, many different countries. So it showed that even in a region where, of course, uh, the tension is very, uh, very visible, very, makes uh, sometimes headlines day after day, uh, still people can build something together and really develop tools which uh, for without that would not be available for people in the region. So I just wanted to, to give this example. I think uh, I don't want to say more on this. So now the question which have come up 
uh, maybe that's uh, one which uh, maybe we keep for the conclusion, which is what is the future of science diplomacy? So maybe we, we wait until the end to, to answer this question. But um, really, um, the challenging question is the, the one, uh, number two, which uh, is values versus perceived economic benefits, what prevails? And of course, at political level, you cannot ignore that at some point, the economic benefits are uh, really uh, very prominent in the minds of politicians. But very often, uh, if you look at the history of uh, development of the world, uh, sometimes you, you have countries which are very low in the scale and become very prominent. An example I, I give quite often is the example of South Korea, who was a country with uh, really a very, very low income, uh, actually very not so many, fac many facilities in terms of science, I'm a mathematician, and the first PhD in mathematics in South Korea was 1947. So very, very close to us. But now, of course, South Korea is a big power. It, uh, it was achieved through a systematic investment into education, long term, as a high, very high priority. But at the same time, with a very sustained in investment in science. And you know, Korea, South Korea at the moment is number two after Israel in terms of a share of the GDP going to science and innovation. So I think uh, it shows that you don't have to have necessarily oil or natural resources. If you mobilize the country, if you have a long-term perspective and you mobilize the energies of the people, you can really change your situation from being at the bottom to become at the top. So it shows that uh, short-term views sometimes are, are not the right thing to do in this perspective. You have to take a longer term but it requires that you have a sustained effort. So this is what I wanted to say on my side, and I want to give the floor now to Dr. Paul Rubik. And you want to stand or to sit, you decide. Yes, first of all, uh, many thanks uh, to Christina Russo. Uh, she brought the international dimension uh, uh, to the European Commission in a very sustainable way. And I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, this morning we had a debate on the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, we have 17, and in New York, uh, uh, they have now the session, uh, United Nations. What can we do with uh, climate? What can we do with research, with science? And uh, so I want to come up with a suggestion. Maybe European Union could uh, nominate 17 ambassadors for every goal of the Sustainable Development Goals and send them to United Nations to explain what Europe is doing in this area. You know, for the Horizon Europe program, we dedicated 35% of the budget to climate research. So uh, if, if we want to show how important this is for our future, future for the next generation, it's clear that we have to tell the public that we are really doing a lot, that we have done a lot, and it's not the case that we didn't do anything. So uh, Europe is going forward in uh, green technology. Uh, you know, green is, for me, agriculture. It's sustainable food. Uh, blue economy is clean water, clean oceans. Uh, and yellow economy is at least the sun and the renewable energy. So it's a target two, six, and seven, which, which is uh, really crucial. And I was, uh, for close to 25 years, member of European Parliament. And I was responsible for budget. You know, we have a yearly budget of 150 billion. Uh, within this budget, we have uh, a small amount for research and science. Uh, the last program has approximately 80 billion. Now, uh, the Pascal Lamy uh, uh, group told us we should double the budget, but at least we are with 100 billion. And my suggestion, we all should stand up and ask for 120 as a red line. We have to show that the future is science-based, that we need uh, the communication on science. And that's the reason why uh, we also uh, understood that we have to educate uh, the politicians, especially the parliamentarians. Uh, that is the reason why we founded STOA. STOA is Scientific Technology Options Assessment of the European Parliament. Uh, it's now for 30 years here, uh, and our main job is uh, to give qualified uh, information uh, to the parliamentarians. We created a map peering scheme, members of European Parliament, you will hear it uh, afterwards. And of course, uh, we created the so-called silo and pipe strategy. We have so many knowledge uh, in the silos of science, but how can we 
get the pipes between the silos. And I think that's the reason why we founded uh, the Science Media Hub, also very warm welcome to the team of the Science Media Hub, to educate young journalists, uh, uh, scientific uh, journalists, uh, to make stories easy to understand, to get storytelling to the point, uh, to uh, educate from the kindergarten to the universities in the small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, and uh, to give this knowledge where we put billions of euro to the broad public to understand how important it is to be on the leading edge of, of science. Uh, and therefore, uh, the future of the uh, science diplomacy is that we break it down to simple messages, but the simple messages should be very close to the truth. So uh, educating people in different areas, especially also with the foresight uh, technology, to see what, which impact does uh, different technologies have on, on cultural area, on economic area, on environmental area, is, is quite important. So in Stoa, we have one sentence which I never want to hear. I have made up my mind, don't bother me with facts. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are more questions coming up. We will take this uh, slightly later. So the floor is yours now, Dr. Gualsole. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, to the Commission for inviting me to speak in this very important and sold out panel. I hear a lot of people, I read a lot of people on Twitter lamenting that they, could, they couldn't get in. So hopefully they are watching. Um, but this really, I think, speaks to the importance and the uh, uh, interest that science diplomacy has in our community. I am so glad to see so many of my colleagues, my friends here. Uh, and I'm here to represent and speak a little bit about this younger generation and how are we going to uh, engage them or how we are already doing um, engaging them in science diplomacy. But also I want to share a little bit of my experience in the Research in, uh, Innovation Science Expert Group uh, advising Commissioner Moedas on science diplomacy. And so it's a very special occasion for me because I just came back from five years working in the US in, in Washington DC at AAAS. I'm very glad my former colleagues are here as well. And I, that was my job, to engage and train and raise awareness among young people, young scientists, young diplomats about science diplomacy. But at the same time, I was crossing the ocean every three months to come to Brussels, which now the carbon footprint, uh, we realize that this is not perhaps the best way to do it. But in, in, I was very glad that I was able to come back to Europe after living for 10 years abroad. And one thing that I realized that I echo Commissioner Moedas' speech this morning is to not take Europe for granted. So when we talk about communication of values of Europe, you, you only realize what we have here when, when you leave. So I lived five years in Australia, five years in the US. And um, it is something that struck me when I um, <clears throat> arrived in other countries that most people don't travel, don't live abroad. In Europe, I'm part of the Erasmus generation, so everybody, I, I didn't have any one single classmate during my degree in biology at the University of Barcelona that did not have an Erasmus experience and, and, and a, um, exchange in another country, allowing them to leave, to study, to make friendship with other people from other countries. <laughs> and I thought that was natural for us. I went on Interrail when I was 18, free borders, no borders, then I was a teenager when the Euro arrived, and I was marveled that I could travel around Europe without exchanging currency. And even today, the roaming allows us to have our plan for our mobile phone um, in, in 28 countries, and it's the same as if we were at home. So all of this, for me, uh, the, the communication of Europe um, has been done very well in the cultural and the education space, but I think science is also one of our greatest assets to communicate the values of Europe um, through research and, and innovation around the world. And so um, I'm telling you all of this, you know it already, but I think uh, we must engage in some more strategic communication around science diplomacy. So. Commissioner um, Moedas, in, in 2015, he started um, his very strong mandate to put science at the center of the EU external action and to embed science diplomacy in the EU uh, strategy. 
And so he made it a top, a top priority, and I was uh, honored to, to be part of that group that uh, was convened four years ago to think and reflect about how science diplomacy could, be, could, could work for Europe and how uh, it could be implemented and communicated through, of course, framework program like Horizon 2020, but also other uh, mechanisms and instruments. I think if we reflect on the past five years, we see many visible examples of science diplomacy. Um, for instance, Plan S, the open access push that the Commission has done, it's really a brand building exercise and a pioneer um, a pioneer exercise to demonstrate um, the European scientific leadership around the world. And this is because when the EU decides on something, the rest of the world has to adapt. And now we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, changes in other countries' um, approaches. Some, are, some of them are um, coming to uh, learn from the EU, and that really sets the soft power that the EU science and innovation is projecting around the world. And I think when we talk about values, and then I, I, I emphasize this because it's really coming up on the, on, the, on the screen, the idea of science diplomacy for Europe was to really reflect the European values, that the, the, the European, um, the EU represents more than its own interests. For instance, when um, during the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, the uh, support that the EU provided was not just about a global health security goal, which is very important. It was also about the EU values dictating that the collective responsibility for the world must be exercised uh, from this uh, continent. And in a more classic description of science diplomacy, we've already talked about uh, peace building. We've already talked about bridging uh, countries that are politically at odds. We talked about Sesame. We also have an ambassador for the Arctic that engages uh, for the whole EU uh, in Arctic issues. And we have uh, Mediterranean programs also engaging with uh, North Africa and, and the Middle East. And so these initiatives demonstrate how Collaboration in research and innovation can yield broader political, societal, economic, and security benefits. And it's already been mentioned that uh, we can promote the integration of less advanced uh, countries scientifically into the global scientific community and, of course, support regional peace and security. Also, the EU, it's very important to mention, that has been a pioneer in um, fostering the intellectual foundation and development of a science diplomacy academic community. So Horizon 2020 had three projects uh, funded in, starting in 2016 that looked at uh, studying science diplomacy, bridging the academic to practitioner gap. And those three were LSEED, S44C, and INSIGHT. And uh, I think two of the three of them are here today, which also really shows that um, the bottom-up approach, so, science, so the Horizon 2020 created mechanisms for bottom-up input into the science diplomacy strategy of the EU. And if you not want to learn more, read the Madrid Science Diplomacy Declaration that was um, launched last year. And, and it really talks more about this connection between science diplomacy values and um, democracy. And so today, the world has changed. And we've already heard in, in, in many ways that multilateralism is uh, under threat. Um, and and the, resur the resurgence of uh, anti-science movements around the world. But I think this is an opportunity. So the geopolitical context um, that we are in the, in the moment, it really provides Europe with a unique opportunity to fill a void in international leadership. Whereas in Europe could be a beacon of openness and global collaboration to strengthen the influence and the positive impact of the EU in an increasingly multipolar and uncertain world. And for that, science diplomacy is going to mean aligning the EU scientific endeavors with the external policies and the strategic partnerships uh, across the globe. I'm not done, should I stop? <laughs> I was going to talk about the young people now. <laughs> okay, just one, one, short, one minute, we, yes. We, we just have a few minutes yes. now. So how are we, so the first question in the, in the, in the, 
and the screen was, what's the future of science diplomacy? So I want to convince you that the future is in the young people. We see um, no further than yesterday in the UN, young people are asking, demanding climate change action based on science. So it is really now the moment of the young people to step in and we must empower them. So how do we do that? There are mechanisms that bring scientists and diplomats together, especially young scientists and young diplomats together. And training at the science policy interface is something that hasn't happened traditionally in scientific careers or in diplomatic careers. So now we have mechanisms like Science Meets Parliament, like fellowships, pairing schemes that bring science and diplomats and policymakers together from a very early stage to really foster this science diplomacy interface that we are um, increasingly lacking in some of these um, global conversations. And finally, I will say that intra EU science diplomacy is also something to consider. It's also, as I said in the beginning, the cultural and the education um, narratives for integration are very well established, but we have an opportunity to, with Horizon Europe, to bring science into that conversation as well. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So let me just uh, try to start to answer the first question. Of course, I will give the floor to the other member of the panel briefly. First, there is an instrument which uh, is already in place, and uh, f as, as far as I could test it, functioning very well, which are the, who are the science councillors of the European Union in various countries. And I must say that uh, each time I visited uh, the, these countries, I'm talking about countries outside Europe, they have been uh, fantastic uh, resources because they have a very good knowledge of communities and they are really remarkably active. I'm very pleased that we are going to meet them uh, at ERC again uh, on uh, Thursday morning. That's one thing. Now concerning the next framework program, which is the whole point of this uh, meeting here, which is Horizon Europe, you know there is still one point which is uh, left open, which is what will be the notion of an associated country. For the moment, the notion of a socialist country, that is countries who can participate in a framework program, is very well defined. It's basically geographically defined. And with rules which are sometimes not so simple to understand how people or how these countries contribute, but this is the case. For the next framework program, the idea is that uh, association could be actually much broader. It could also, uh, I mean, some countries which are not geographically close could also be considered as possible associate countries. And uh, the condition would be that these countries would have a, more or less a system or, share, uh, or sharing values of the European research in a good way. And I could hear the commissioner and also the director general mention this possibility to countries like Singapore or uh, Japan. Of course, I could witness that with, uh, with uh, Canada and also Australia. Just to give examples, this is not a limited uh, a, a list which is uh, closed. It's just uh, the, the thing. In the case of ERC, just to finish my uh, try to answer this, so this is still being debated, this question of what will be the exact definition of association, what it will mean. This has been put on a reserve list of things to be discussed for the preparation of next framework program. It has to be decided by the end of 2020, because on the 1st of January 2021, we need to have a framework program uh, approved. In the case of ERC, uh, actually, uh, one of our mottos is open to the world, which is one of the three O's of uh, Commissioner Moidash. And this is even uh, on top of the uh, world map, which is in my office. So this is something I, I cannot forget, because every day I can see it. And actually, we are really very eager to develop further re relations. At the moment, there are 12 countries with which we have signed so-called implementing arrangements, which makes it possible for scientists from these countries to collaborate with uh, teams from supported by ERC. But I want to give the opportunity to members of the panel to say something on some of the questions, or if you don't find any question, really, um, please. Yes, maybe. Uh Within STOA, no, it's, go it's, going to. it's coming automatically. Yeah? Within STOA, as a scientific technology options assessment of European Parliament, we created now an international advisory board. And this international advisory board should bring people who are like minded together uh, to form a policy which is not only concentrated on European issues. I think the global adventure of delivering is so strong that we have to do more. Thank you. Chris, if you allow me to call you this way. 
Mike. Sure. Yeah, I don't have any. I, I, I was hoping that uh, folks in the audience would have a question. I don't know if we uh, do I have time for that. Or are we just looking at the screen? Just, well, yeah, because then it would mean going back. And, maybe you have. Go ahead. Microphone, please. I was going to say some people don't use apps, so maybe there are questions that they have in mind, but they don't know how to put them in the in the system. So just yeah, but then it complicates the okay. whole thing. Okay. So I'm sorry to be restrictive <laughs> on this. So are there some questions which uh, strikes you? It's the rise of artificial intelligence is what it is. So. Yes. You want to say something on this about artificial intelligence? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but well, we're being, be being, we're taking over by the machines here. Um, well, so one question um, which I think uh, I implicitly asked, or maybe explicitly asked, was uh, the values versus perceived economic uh, benefits, what prevails. I think you made a good point that that is another reason why uh, countries engage in science and technology. They want to make better, they want uh, better lives for their people, economic development and so forth. But I think like, you know, the rubric of, of you know, co shared values as a, as a as a precursor for traditional scientific cooperation, I think that in, in that case we do have the well-established, uh, messy, yes, but well-established frameworks in uh, intellectual property protection. And the question there when we get into the applied, when we get into the economically relevant is, is it a win-win for the cooperation? Is it a, uh, you know, do we share in the benefits? Do we respect the agreements that we've developed? Um, uh, I think that's important. I think I'm going on a little bit of a different tack than you guys, but I, I do think this idea of shared values, uh, communicating our shared values, is is a really important part of science diplomacy. Maybe to the question of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, in the Science uh, Media Hub, which we created, of course, we are very focused on the analytics of information. I, I spoke about the silo and pipe strategy, and now we want to do more research on science. Uh, on the communication. So the communication means what can we learn out of machine learning? How can we use artificial intelligence to find the white spaces of information and uh, are prepared to deliver the information to the people where the system knows that uh, they are in need of? And uh, that leads us to a new kind of science metrics uh, debate. How can we keep it as efficient as possible? Do you want to, please? You yeah, just think, have two minutes. Yes. The cooperation versus competition is, is going to in, be an increasing uh, area of tension. Uh, I don't know if you, if you heard that a few days ago, uh, the U.S., uh, the White House, launched a directive to protect um, the research enterprise from foreign influence. And so now we're seeing a tension between academic freedom, freedom of collaboration, mobility, and all these other interests that countries need to protect for economic competitiveness. And so I think that's a very important area of growth of science diplomacy uh, and tech diplomacy more than, more than anything. Um, and also to the, the, the other strand that we haven't touched upon, but it's, I think, very important in the future is going to be the disruption of diplomacy itself. Uh, because of AI and machine learning and all of the new emerging technologies are really going to disrupt and already disrupting the way we conduct diplomacy. So diplomacy itself is uh, evolving uh, very fast and some saying that it's going to be obsolete very soon because why do you need an ambassador when you have all the other, all these other tools at your disposal? So that's another area that's very interesting to, to debate perhaps uh, later. Thank you. So I have uh, less than one minute to conclude, uh, which is, uh, I think you've seen that uh, any time you discuss science diplomacy, you're always this uh, tension between individuals and institutions. And of course, uh, as a scientist myself, and also in charge of a European Research Council, which is really a structure which is strictly bottom-up, I'm really defending very strongly the, the need for the, to leave room for individuals to take initiative. Uh, of course, uh, this can uh, be made easier if the institutions take the right uh, attitude and uh, right open, create these open spaces. But uh, we know that in some cases, actually, institutions just have the opposite attitude. They want to restrict these, uh, this space. So I think uh, science diplomacy will always be, uh, be a, um, a topic on which you see this tension between two approaches, one which is really uh, led, led by uh, people wanted to move, wanted to do things, and institutions who want to really have uh, control over things. So this tension is always present. 
I want to thank you for having listened to this debate for one hour, but I think we have to close now because I think we are just at the end of our time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bourguignon, for having chaired this um, panel. Thank you to the panelists. Thanks to all of you for your attention. Thanks to the Princess Sumaya via Dr. Khaled. And uh, I hope that uh, we will retain those messages uh, and uh, we will continue to work, all of us, uh, in order to have uh, a science diplomacy flourishing in the next uh, framework program for research and innovation. Thank you. Thank you.